Hi guys, hope you're well. Uh, I must admit this is now my fourth live stream in two weeks. Uh, so I must admit the learning curve has kind of gone through the roof. Uh, the first time I tried to do it, I didn't really know what I was doing. The second time we had a problem with Zoom. The third time the sound was off and the fourth is just today. Uh, but again, one of the things that I've kind of spoke about throughout is that for me and for everyone kind of with lockdown, it was the chance that I've still been kind of working full time flat out for different customers and you know, basically working all the time. But likewise, I never really want to miss the opportunity to learn new stuff. So every week um, I've been learning new things, even just from buying the camera equipment and the kind of lighting and sound and different things. Um, and actually, I'm hoping today is again another kind of jump, good step up moving forward. Um, one of the things that I'm kind of I've always been keen to do is that so my job is all about business strategy. It's helping different companies grow. I'm really trying to solve problems and help people take that next step. Uh, and one of the things which is especially true in kind of difficult times is that when companies are looking to diversify, or even if they're not, but they're looking for innovation ideas of what, what to do next, one of the best kind of most valuable things you can actually do is interact and learn from people that aren't in your normal circle. Uh, so when I was kind of looking for guests and I was trying to figure out who to invite onto this kind of uh, podcast live stream, one of my friends, Jake, popped up and I'm going to bring him in in a second uh, and he can kind of introduce himself. But again, so my background is largely offshore energy, manufacturing, uh, that kind of thing, that actually speaking to people in healthcare and in different sectors, it's, it's great for me to kind of ask some questions and ask the things that you might kind of want to know. But then likewise, for a lot of my kind of um, contacts who might be in marketing or sales, again, the more you understand about the customer and different people in different sectors, it will help us all kind of do our jobs better. So that's the aim of today. It's to kind of introduce you to someone new, pick Jake's brains, Jake can pick mine. Uh, and without further ado, I'll just bring him in. So hi, Jake, do you want to say hi to everyone? Hi, Steve. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, so my name is Jake. I'm a, a dentist uh, from the Midlands current and working in the Midlands currently. Um, I know Steve from university, which is how we know each other. Um, uh, and uh, I moved down here into the Midlands and um, doing a master's as well now. So, yeah, I've oh, kind nice. of further. So just I like to give people context because, again, it's a funny one that with uh, I've said to kind of some of the previous guests and actually we'll touch on this later is that I tend to only speak to people I actually kind of know. Uh, and then likewise, I, I don't, because with branding, which is essentially what every company does, everyone that works themselves, you know, is, is all about. I actually don't mind telling people the backstory. So actually me and Jake used to play in the uh, USB, so the University of Sheffield basketball team. And actually, was I your coach for a little bit? I can't remember. You were, you were. I was um, there when you were coaching, yeah. And you coached the debut. Yeah, no, it's true. Um, but you know, so we've probably known each other. Two thousand eight, I think, was when I went back to do my postgrad. I started two thousand nine, so it's a, yeah, it's a year after. Yeah, um, and then essentially, it was funny that with we've not, I've never interviewed anyone off the basketball team yet, but I probably will. I think I'll probably get Josh on quite a lot. And basically, Josh yeah. is one of our friends that works for. We still works at Sheffield University, and he's a lecturer in, in philosophy. But one of the things I was going to say, actually, from our kind of group of friends in that particular team, almost everyone's gone on to do some really impressive stuff. And it's one of those things almost as a separate kind of leadership question is actually to do with how sometimes I think if you get a good group of people that attack whatever it is they're looking to do, but actually, you know, there was no egos. There were some egos, but you know what I mean? And it was almost how everyone seemed to have forged their own path and gone on to do really good things. And it's, you know, it's a pleasure because we actually haven't spoken for probably two years. I think it was last All Boys. So every year, every year there's wow. a Sheffield All Boys game uh, where we kind of go back and play and get drunk for a weekend and stuff. And it's, uh, I'm now easily the oldest. I was the oldest anyway. Uh, so actually I couldn't make it this year. But anyway, regardless. Um, so Jake, do you want to kind of tell people what you do? Yeah, um, yeah. so uh, I'm a dentist. Um, like I say, I work in the, the Midlands. Uh, at the moment, I work in general practice. Um, I work in mainly private dentistry now as well. Uh, we do a little bit of NHS work for children mainly, um, but it's mainly, in, like I say, in a private setting. And I split my time over a couple of practices uh, where I uh, basically get to treat lots of different patients. Um, mm -hmm. And at the moment in my career, like I say, I'm at, back at university again. I'm uh, doing a master's degree so that I can start to just specialize a little bit more. So, okay. So um, do you mind if I unpick this a little bit just because it's both interesting? Yeah, yeah. Actually, it's almost part of the 
the background. So we'll start on the masters because again, a lot of my kind of audience and people I speak to quite a few uh, do things like an MBA where they've obviously uh-huh. had a, some sort of career, then they're looking to make that next step. Uh, and actually yeah. one of my former guests, Ashley did exactly that. Um, so for yourself, you were uh, qualified into dentistry, you should qualify dentist. And then this was to yeah. make the next kind of step up. Is that right? Yeah, so yeah, like I say, I qualified in 2014, um, and most people then do a foundation training. So basically a year where you work within the NHS, uh, you have a sort of a tutor to help you oversee things, mm-hmm. uh, because uh, at dental school you don't get um, you know exposure to everything. You get a good wide range of stuff, but you don't see everything. So you have someone there to fall back on. Uh, okay. And then everyone has to take about three years generally in practice. Uh, some people take different avenues. They start to go into hospital-based dentistry, um, uh, and then some people go into general practice uh, and then you have to have that sort of at least three years and then you can start on a master's program if you want to. Um, and it's a way into sort of a specialism. Uh, okay. So I chose to do endodontics, uh, which is basically root canal treatment. And that started to become then my, my sort of area of specialism and my, my uh, focus now. Oh, cool. So on the bit that you said before, because I wouldn't have guessed this, you said you work across a number of practices. Yeah. So does that... So for instance, with myself, I have different clients that I, okay, in lockdown, they're all remote, but in, in normal kind of course of business, I might do a Monday at one company, Tuesday, Wednesday, somewhere else, Thursday, somewhere else, because they act as, or they are separate businesses that bring me in to do stuff, whatever that yeah. stuff is. Is it, is it the same with yourself? Are you, are you self-employed? Is that kind of how it works? Okay. Um, for me, um, I'm not self-employed, okay. but I am employed via my own limited company. Um, and uh, but most most dentists mainly are self-employed, okay. um, so you work for a practice as an associate. Uh, I'm a limited company, basically off the the advice of my accountant, and that's mm-hmm. how and why most dentists end up going uh, down that limited company route. Oh, so um, I have the same discussion, and I have it with my wife. So luckily, my wife's a solicitor, so we talk things through quite a lot. Because I set up in October, um, and I purposely went because again I'm. I'm, I'm good at what I do, but I'm also quite realistic that I knew that I might fail. And then likewise, you almost need to test water. So I started as a sole trader, just working for myself, self-employed. Yeah. And then actually touch some wood. Um, I'm now at the point where I'll be registering for VAT at some point, which is, you know, good. It's a, it's a big milestone that I purposely yeah. didn't want to do it early doors because again, I might never have got to that point. Um, yeah. And then for me, it's almost that discussion on, do I do the whole same limited company thing? Just because it's, what I do, there's limited risk. I don't necessarily own stock or property or bills or whatever. So I'm still kind of thinking that one through. Um, so, you know, out of interest, is it because you um, act on people that there's a potential, at least in insurance risk, is it to protect yourself? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Now, we all have uh, professional indemnity or insurance on that basis, yeah, regardless. So, so yeah. regardless of how you, uh, you know, operate as a sole trader, as a, you know, a, an employee, or uh, like I say, as a self-employed, we all have that indemnity anyway. Uh, mine was basically on the basis of um, financial implications mainly. Okay. Um, it's the difference between being self-employed uh, and, and a limited company. It's not as obviously as it was previously, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and everyone on a dental point of view, I can say everyone and my everyone's basis is is, is how it works for them. Uh, okay. And I can say after after a few years of being self employed, discussing with my accountant, discussing what I wanted to do personally in a strategy going forward, and how I saw my sort of career developing, we decided that that limited route was was best for me. No, I must say it makes sense. It's just, but again, this is part of the beauty of it for me because I like to you know quite literally talk things through in a way that. You know, nobody in my family before me had necessarily graduated from university. So again, that was a you know a learning curve. But again, I don't actually know anyone personally, family wise, that has run their own business before. So I actually do ask friends and colleagues and different things. And almost because a lot of the people I speak to, um, you know, I'd like to just share my own kind of journey because again, that's part of the. For me, it's the authenticity about what I'm doing. Um, yeah. But actually, I know that it'll help other people that are looking to kind of do the same. Mm-hmm. so yeah. out of interest one of the things that you know so my kind of the, the show if you want to call it that that i kind of do is always kind of to do with yeah. business strategy and almost how um you think through different business models and almost you know how people grow kind of moving forward 
So for yourself as a dentist, if you ignore the technical side of it in terms of actually fixing people, yep. do you still have to consider all, everything to do with sales, marketing, branding, um, that kind of thing? Yeah, definitely. So I, I think this is more of a, a modern day way of thinking of it. Traditionally, the, you know, the associate worked for the practice. The practice took care of all the marketing. They did you know, all the business side of it, the sales side of it. Um, and that was the kind of traditional model. Uh, I think uh, nowadays, especially with the rise of corporate dental practices, mm -hmm. sort of buying up all the, you know, the single-handed or the, you know, the small businesses, yep. uh, dentists are a lot more becoming a, a personal brand, I suppose, uh, I guess, which is where it throws similarities in with yourself, is a lot of dentists are branding themselves. And it's something that I'm doing as well. Uh, and so trying to become my own sort of entity uh, and branding it as, as me working in that practice. Exactly the same. Because it's almost, for me, is that when my three previous jobs, actually, I'm going to be careful what I say here, but there's a reason why I chose to work for myself. And again, it's almost the the way I kind of try and articulate it is the law I officially launched as people could hire me as of October. Arguably, I've been building my brand for the last 10, 12 years. Um, you know, everything from all of the videos and, you know, you kind of post some different things because actually people hire you as opposed to just the brand is the way I kind of, kind of see it. Um, so I completely hundred percent agree. So out of interest and basically what I want to do is almost pick your brains. What do you see as the main drivers and actually an inter interesting question, who do you actually target? Do you target practices who would hire you to do a job and because that's what I do or yeah. do you brand yourself in a B2C kind of um, you know for the end customer yeah um, I'd say it was, it was more of a like a B2C uh, okay. because uh, as an associate we're working in a place um, and so I think again that's why myself it's a little bit different because I work in two practices but um, basically for the same person so okay. we just work across two sites um, obviously, a lot of associates who take the same route as me will work with multiple companies. So, a lot of our advertising and, and sales stuff is driven B two C because uh, we're aiming, at, you can say, directly at our patients. Yeah. Um, so, offering our services and what we do, um, and then we like to try and drive a lot of in house stuff as well. So, recommendations from patients because in healthcare, that's still the biggest driver. Although, you know, you can do. The, the traditional marketing in that sense and a lot of people are on Instagram as dentists now it's okay. hugely popular thing and, and, and Facebook and stuff but yeah I think straight to consumer for us is, is still where you know because where that basis is. It, I'm just trying to think this through almost as a business model so for instance my local dentist is the one I picked because it's local yep. you know it, it's almost a, a funny thing because from a, a strategy point of view imagine you had a practice which I guess you kind of do it's almost that balance of where and all most businesses, not all, most businesses want to grow. And I guess mm. it's that balance of where you most practices, again, probably have a capacity, you know, so like your, your trading times, I'm going to guess are probably 8 a.m. till 7 p.m. And then maybe one yeah. that, but yeah. my point is, but there's a, a limited number of appointments per day that you can actually yeah. kind of do. So in, in that case, do practice owners or business owners then just look to buy more practices? Or is it one of my later questions I'll save? But it's almost, you know, I guess it's, you've already answered the question and I'm answering it myself just because I like to think it through. So you okay. do actually get bigger corporations that purposely buy practices to aggressively grow, like mergers and acquisitions? Yeah, yeah. So I can say that that aspect is, like I say, from a practice owner side of things, definitely. So um, yeah, you're getting the big corporates. So things like Booker, for example, uh, My Dentist, uh, Roderick's. They're sort of the bigger corporates in the game. Mine is a My Dentist, and outside yeah. the um, so it's on Durham Road, which is in Gateshead, and there's this really hideous rockery of a giant pair of lips outside. <laughs> And it's just someone's missed the mark on the taste angle. So when you yeah. go past on the bus, you can see this thing. Uh, but no, I mean, that kind of makes a lot of sense. So then it's so almost it's it's like a freelancer market within a larger marketplace. Is that kind of correct? Yeah, as an, as an associate, yeah. Um, it's freelance, but with a little bit less freedom. It's probably the easiest way of explaining it. I've got um, 
when you take on uh, an associateship, you're not always tied in. Uh, and personally, I'm not tied in per se contractually to stay there. Okay. Um, but we had an agreement where is, this is what I want to do in my career. This is what my boss wanted from me. And, and obviously we made that kind of agreement. Um, but it's also then harder to just sort of move around uh, because you have a duty of care to patients. Um, you can't just go tomorrow. That's it for me. I'm not turning up anymore. Uh, uh, there's, there's a, you know, we have a period of time where we have to be there. But, but almost based on that is that, you know, from past experience, if you have a good workplace, a good environment, um, you know, you probably want to stay there. And it, it's yeah. that kind of thing is that when, uh, you know, people always think that the grass can be greener. So they get frustrated with stuff. But actually, if you find a good workplace, it's probably worth its weight in gold. And it's that same kind of thing that one of the things that I love about my job is building the personal relationships with different teams. And the kind of the more you get in, embedded into it, that's actually what gets me excited every day. And I want to do a good job for same you know people. So I guess it's almost similar with yourself that when you have a good, I guess, practice, you know, good yeah. kind of group of people. So yeah. do you employ staff or does that work through the kind of the practice itself? Yeah, so the practice basically sets all that up. Uh, in effect, I suppose the easiest model to kind of um, compare it to is almost like a barber renting a chair. I, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I turn up, more or less everything is there ready waiting for me, the reception staff, the nursing, the equipment, everything. Uh, and then I just turn up and I, I bring a small bit of equipment with me, stuff that's easily transportable, but you know, in effect, everything is there ready for me. The patient's almost in the chair, so to speak, and I just walk in and do but, my job. But it's almost from a from a business point of view th- that's almost the dream in many ways because it's every every business goes from a point where you start somewhere generally with nothing and then over time you kind of build it up that it's yeah. it's almost someone else as part of your your fee that i guess you pay they're almost doing your business development for you and bringing you the customers yeah so it's a fascinating kind of way to just kind of talk it through um yeah, to yeah. kind of expand on it further and is, is the dream one day to own your own practice or a set of practices? I just want to kind of think it through. Yeah. Um, and I think so, yeah, at some point. Um, it's one of those things that is, for me, is a little bit later or potentially a much later down the line type of thing. Yeah. I know for a lot of dentists it is to go in and I'm buy like We're practice. both young, so we've got time. Yeah. I, I kind of have other things, other aspirations that I want to do before I do that. Um, so for me personally... Not right now, uh, but it's a never say never thing. It's I, I did look at it a few years ago, so okay. but then I decided the place, you know, the position wasn't right. Because this is almost where the branding piece comes in, because it's almost why would people hire you as opposed yeah. to someone else? And it's almost I think one of the the mistakes that some people make is that whenever they start on their own, whatever it is they kind of go on to do, is that they go from a job, they quit the job, they start the new freelance, and then they start to promote themselves. Is actually what you want to start doing is building your brand years in advance and just getting out there, raising your profile, speaking to people. So it kind of does does kind of make perfect sense. Um, a lot of my kind of audience and backgrounds and almost one of the things that I'm starting to get more into is tech. Um, and this is in the northeast of England. There's actually a really big tech scene, um, much bigger than you'd think, actually. Uh, I don't know what the stats are, but it's really kind of growing and thriving. And one of the big things that a lot of people kind of look for is how you look to build a scalable business and this is almost where you uh, you develop some sort of product knowledge or ip or app where essentially you put the work in up front that is almost your branded uh, product and then it's the idea that you can sell it unlimited number of times for a limited number of effort and therefore you can scale kind of exponentially yep. kind of in healthcare is there anything like that or in dentistry um to scale like that i think probably as an individual it's a little bit more difficult because obviously we are one to time basis so i can't scale myself i'd love to and make a lot more because i think from when i have followed some of your um kind of instagram feeds but you have and i might get this wrong there's dentists that teach other dentists how to do like photography is that right yeah uh, yeah so that is a scalable thing that courses are, are a big sort of avenue um, outside of dentistry, um, obviously development of materials and uh, equipment and stuff. Uh, um, so yeah, I know there's, a, there's quite a few dentists that have um, that, that do things like that or work with manufacturers to, to develop new products and things like that. Oh, interesting. Uh, like I said, the, the photography and the courses, that's uh, a huge thing now. Uh, probably 
COVID has probably helped some of that as well, because a lot of people are, have the time to develop those things now, and people a lot of webinars are going out and putting information and stuff out, so that's going to help accelerate a lot of those things. But it's almost based on that. So before we came on, and again, I've known Jake for a while, I was showing him some of my setup that when um, lockdown happened, I knew I, I owned some of the kit because actually I started my first photography company when we first met. So like 2008, 2009. So I've, I've known how to do it for a while. But then a lot of the kind of business education stuff to help teach people how to grow and sell their companies is what I do day to day. So again, part of what I'm looking at is how do I do that? And now it's me adapting to do it from home. Uh, but one of the things I'm looking at is almost how can I, with the book, make packages, make it available. And for me, it's almost trying to, uh, I want to create the world's best value training course. And this is to help people from all different sectors just make that next step. But it's almost my learning curve probably a year before I even try and commercialize it is this. It's one-to-one -one kind of stuff. And again, on the kind of the webinars and different things, it's almost, I want as a branding point of view to try and get the quality as good as possible uh, so i imagine for like a dentist probably what what would you say is the biggest buying driver for a customer in terms of patients you mean yeah so you know, when they're looking for a dentist yeah. i'm guessing trust is something that you're really trying to get across yeah i think yeah trust is probably the biggest thing i think that's what makes or breaks all dental relationships yeah. Uh, everyone talks about you know that rapport that you build up with your patient uh, because things are inevitably going wrong or going to go wrong stuff's going to go badly in dentistry is, is in all healthcare so that trust um, is I think key because if someone doesn't trust you we're in a very personal intimate business we're <laughs> in your face and that's a really <laughs> bad joke but we are really really in your face and, and so yeah if that trust isn't there and a lot of people are, are fearful for the dentist as well you know a lot of people have that phobia of going to the dentist and seeing the dentist it's it, that's sure. interesting because with um so if, if we'd start to bring this back to almost some kind of sales techniques uh, i'm sure you've seen wolf of wall street uh so the guy <laughs> called jordan belford who does that so basically one yeah. of the the sales techniques when you're almost when you're trying to sell something to someone and they've had a bad experience in the past, it's called a buying wound. So what you're trying to do is overcome that, ideally with your marketing up front. So even before they get in touch, they've bought a car from Volvo before and it they, didn't, they hated it. So if you want to try and sell them another car, you need to overcome in advance why that won't happen with you. And it's almost, again, with dentistry, is it, you know, there could actually be mileage within your marketing and your branding to address the fears that people have. So for instance, we have quiet drills. We look after our patients. We use anesthetic and almost just walk them through the basics of everything that might stop them coming to you. Does that make sense? And yeah, guess, we definitely, we, sorry. We de sorry. Yeah, we, we do a lot on the, the patient journey, uh, especially at our practice and things like that. Is the, it's looking at the whole journey. And like you say, from the moment they walk in the door, you know, how do they perceive the front of the practice? How do they perceive how reception talk to them? Even down to the waiting room and stuff like that. And we do lots of things and small little things sometimes. And it's, you know, the way things are laid out, yeah. uh, the smell that the practice has, because no one wants to walk into that smell, that clinical environment. Because a lot of <laughs> studies showing that that smell is actually what people are. As yeah. soon as they smell that dentist smell, the fear starts. It'll be so. like a Pavlov's dogs type thing. Is No, that, that is, I never thought this through. This is very clever. This is why this is yeah. good. I know people are clever. nowadays getting sorry to, again. People are nowadays getting other people to design their practice outside of the traditional sense. So I know lots of people who've had hotel designers actually come and design the practice, so that it doesn't feel or look like a dental practice. Because when the, um, have you read any of Gordon Ramsay's books? There was one yeah, in particular yeah, yeah. Um, that I picked up from my nephew's school fate for a pound. And it basically went through uh, Gordon Ramsay's early kind of career. And one of the big things that he did and really kind of made money from was that obviously he knows how to cook food, but actually through, he learned how to build and design restaurants. And now he has whole parts of his business that do very well, just telling other people how to make and design a kitchen and a restaurant. So actually that could be a scalable part of your business yeah. is actually helping other people design their businesses. And it's just, but what you've said is actually fascinating. Um, can I dig into a bit more just on some of the, how general kind of uh, dentistry practices work? Is that cool? I just I'm trying to understand it. So for instance, yeah. do you balance your revenues between like a baseline NHS 
base load and then do you make your kind of cream off private stuff is that kind of how it works uh, that's not how it works for me personally but i know okay. it's how it works for a lot of dentists um a lot of dentists yeah have a set amount of nhs work that they do uh, we call it udas which is a unit of dental activity uh, they'll agree with the uh, owner that you do this many per um per year so basically april to april uh, mm -hmm. you do that many and then everything else then potentially becomes private and so they can upsell so to speak to their nhs patients selling them other options other alternatives uh, me like i say i work on a 95 percent uh private basis so okay. i don't do it in any that sense at all we see I think how many um, I see my in terms of you know percentage of revenue on NHS and it's it's a, it's yeah somewhere between ninety five and, and okay five so yeah it's a little bit different. What I was trying to almost do is that with so for a lot of businesses when you look into a lot of what I do is company turnarounds but where mm -hmm. you're trying to uh, take a company makes X amount of profit and you're trying to make a lot more profit quickly but then you're also trying to balance this with long term stable baseline and what I was almost trying to just investigate is almost for um, say I'm going to pick a, a recruitment company or it could be a manufacturing company <clears throat> you almost have your larger volume baseload turnover that covers your bills but you don't make yeah. a huge amount of profit on but you, you, you almost you have the security that you have foresight on you know kind of stuff going forward and then actually you have the much higher margin quick turnaround uh, cosmetic kind of stuff um, yeah. and just but what's interesting is that almost every business has that does that make sense so obviously yeah. from a dentist healthcare point of view the similar model is the same as recruitment as it is in manufacturing and it's just it's fascinating to kind of pick apart and then almost i'm guessing you are in the the higher value better bit which is where i'm trying to aim towards mm -hmm. that actually you know it's no fascinating and this is why i was kind of keen to to pick your brains on it can I ask about kind of healthcare in general as a sector? So not necessarily just about kind of dentistry, but, you know, kind of the whole kind of sphere in the UK. Yeah. Um, just because it's a question that I don't know the answer to, but it's not a kind of a loaded question. What's yeah. your viewpoint on uh, the kind of, when people say the commercialization of the NHS, mm -hmm. what, what, what do you feel is, that is? Um, in... <sighs> In our sector, I'm going to say again, it kind of works a little bit differently uh, to the general NHS. Um, so, in a sense, the almost the whole uh, whole business is is commercial already, uh, because the NHS basically on a contract basis hand out contracts to individual practice owners, and so while they provide a service for the NHS, it already is in a commercial entity in that respect. Okay. So, basically, you get an agreed uh, let's say an agreed contract value for x amount of units and you provide that unit and then it doesn't matter or, or say obviously to a certain degree it doesn't matter how you provide that um so mm -hmm. there's a there's a huge swing in the i would say the quality of nhs industry across the country okay. um because it's a massive gray area and there's lots of interpretation on the different rules and regulations that it all works at um and to be honest i think most people would agree uh, in dentistry um, to a certain aspect, that parts of the NHS are, are failing, unfortunately. Okay. Um, uh, and a lot of that is down to kind of the funding aspect of it. Um, the current sort of NHS contract was negotiated in 2006. Um, and and a lot's lot of changed that, a lot since then. No. And so mm -hmm. the fees that a practice is given a lot of the time is this, almost exactly the same as it was in 2006. But, you know, 14 years later, we're trying to provide an ever increasing, uh, you know, increasingly um, improved service. So that's where, again, a, a lot of dentists like myself who might have worked somewhere full time uh, and, and on an NHS basis are now moving towards private dentistry because um, it's just not really working and that's trying to not be too political. No, no I have got you. <laughs> it was yeah. just the, because what is, is fascinating, just it's the, that's so true across so many different sectors. And, you know, yeah. it's just not often do you get the chance to kind of ask these kind of questions, but actually the parallels are, you know, surprising. Uh, yeah. So, no, thank you for that. Have you spotted any kind of trends moving forward? Like is, are more people starting to go private or, you know, are people starting to pay more or they care more about their own like appearance, you know, the cosmetic side of it? Just any kind of trends and that kind of thing? 
Yeah, cosmetics uh, over the last 10 years has become a huge, huge, uh, you know, increasing market. Um, lots of adults are starting to be more aware of their mouths, be more aware of their appearance and things like that. So yeah, that's a, a you know, rapidly expanding market. And, and dentists are not just doing the traditional stuff, you know, they're offering uh, more orthodontically driven stuff. So braces and things to adults, huge market. Mm-hmm. Um, Botox is, uh, and, you know, fillers, all this kind of stuff, a lot of skincare regimes and stuff like that. So starting to move away a little bit from traditional dentistry in because that actually, sense. Just, I'm just going to think out loud, but it's that balance of where if with any business, you're always looking at the customer and then what are the customer's pain points and arguably what else can you sell them? And actually what you've just said is because you're seen as a, a trusted provider. So my dentist actually, I really like the guy. Um, and you know, so f- what else would people have? And yeah, so Botox, it's almost anything which has that element of cosmetic appearance to do with the human person. And you would want to get that from someone that you trust in a way that, yes, you could go to Gateshead High Street and so-and-so and get your lip fillers, but you wouldn't trust it anywhere near as much as you could or would from a dentist. Yeah. You know, but it's just, and then almost the thing in this through, it's almost then if you were going to brand a new practice, you know, you wouldn't necessarily have to call it a dentist. You would call it a health center, not health center, health, health practice, yeah. but you could sell six or seven or 10 different things which again, you could just oversee, but you could have on your staff, Sally that does lip fillers, you know, but I can see how you can actually grow the business quite quickly. Um, yeah, and yeah. Then, one of the biggest dentists in the world uh, works out in Lisbon in Portugal, uh, Port- uh, yeah, Portugal. Um, and yeah, his practice I think has 14 treatment rooms and they yeah. offer everything from dental care, but all the way to, um, uh, was it, um, they do, psychiatry based stuff they have um they do all cosmetic surgery so not just dental stuff they do all aspects of it and his clinic is ridiculously big and huge because but it's but, transitioned away from just dentistry but on that point it's it's a bit from a, a, a disruptive strategy point of view it's the idea to look beyond the original cell which is through your teeth what yeah. else does that person have and how do you expand it and then because the flip side as well is that from like when we were students, I had no money at all. And actually, you get, as you go through your career, things change. So actually, you know, you, you're able to pay for more things that actually I will get my teeth done. I will get that. And then actually even uh, the next level still is that you want the service, but then you actually want the experience. So it, it won't be a mistake, the fact that it's in Portugal and you probably go out, have a week off before you even go, get some yeah. get some stuff done, go back and almost make it like a spa week. Yep. But again, from a, from a business point of view, you can take Jake's dentistry practice and then suddenly expand it and probably make it three, four, five times bigger. Yeah. But you, that's how you can grow and scale when you've only yeah. got so much time yourself. Yeah, yeah I've enjoyed yeah. that. It's good. Yeah, that's that's where we see you know the the big names in dentistry. That's where they're scaling things either from. Uh, more practices and more clinics or different avenues. Um, there's people that, like I said, develop new equipment, new, new, new procedures. Uh, there's guys that do, there's a dental property club as well, uh, where, you know, this guy decided that dentistry wasn't for him, decided that property investing was where he wanted to go. Um, and he's, he now runs courses and seminars on buying property. So, you know, so there's a, there. an absolute seamless transition uh, because I know we spoke offline about this. So my was he my last guest, one of my previous guests was a guy called Charlie, who's someone I used to work with, and he went into property. And is that almost a thing that you, and what I'm trying to do is almost from a different point of view. So you have um, most dentist stroke business owners probably do quite well that they then have spare cash to invest in different places. And it's almost then, yes, you could actually develop a whole brand based around being the specialist that helps dentists find property, you know, it's trying to find your super niche. And then actually when you do your own marketing and promotion, actually being able to focus on different things, there's so many avenues that someone, yourself or whoever, could actually take their career from one area and actually go into six, seven other things. Mm-hmm. Um, have you ever explored property or looked at anything like that yourself or only kind of at home or... Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm currently looking into it. It's something my dad has uh, experience in as well, uh, on a very small scale. 
Um, he is a joiner builder by trade. So basically started off buying his own rundown properties and started putting them together and, and you know, trying to uh, rent properties. And so it's something that we're looking in the next year to two years to basically start together in. So I'm very early in my kind of property journey, I would say, okay. uh, you know, right at the very beginning. Uh, but it's something that, yeah, looking forward, that's one way that I want to kind of diversify my sort of portfolio in uh, and work towards. No, that's cool. Um, I'm conscious you're very busy and obviously it's, uh, you know, there's a lot kind of going on at the moment. Uh, do you mind if I kind of ask you just as we kind of start to wrap up almost yeah. from, can I ask you almost what, what is the best piece of advice you've ever had? Best piece of advice I've ever had? Uh <laughs> always a good question well, I, ask, um, I like i ask everyone this and it's almost yeah. the, the different people say different things uh but actually yeah. just i find the feedback really interesting and it's mm -hmm. just it's uh, anything you've got that you kind of like to share um i think never basically never stop learning and never be satisfied um i think that goes you know all aspects of life not just dentistry from a dental point of view there's there's always the new technique there's always the new you know um, way of doing things uh, and again personally and it's never just sort of resting on your laurels of you know I've done a five-year dental degree I know how to do everything and uh, you know because you'll quickly get at pace to, you know say in the market you know and everywhere really. I think that's a great one because it's the I almost do it for fun so it, it sounds really sad but it's just the when again I started on my own I actually do this one to pay the bills but actually I really enjoy it I just this and learning how to do it because one of the things that I almost see as a competitive advantage is that I think I can learn faster than most people so for instance say with live streaming I knew that for most businesses or even for yourself it, it's something that will only get bigger as it kind of goes forward but in the space of kind of two weeks stand and start to go from nothing to a home office kind of setup was it's the ability to innovate and actually part of the reason why i love doing these kind of talks is just to learn from different people because i constantly want to get better um mm -hmm. so no, i think that's a kind of fantastic piece of advice um can i ask the next one which is almost to do with um if you were to give advice to your younger self and this could be 2009 jake who's going to uni or it could be 2050 whoever you want is there anything in particular you know that you would kind of say to your younger self um, I think it would have been to potentially uh, start earlier uh, in in terms of um, doing more from an earlier you know an earlier period of time. Um, so from a personal level of the property side of things, you know, starting earlier, starting investing earlier in that sense. Um, and I think uh, from a again from a dental point of view this time, I think again going and and doing more earlier, reading more earlier. I think starting early is is key. Obviously, it's never too late, never too late to start. But I think starting early would have been uh, would have just pushed my journey a little bit quicker. I completely agree. It was when I went back to Sheffield to have a client meeting probably two months ago, and what was quite funny, I think it was because I live in Newcastle now. So when uh, I kind of travelled back down, it was I hadn't been for quite a while, and then I was kind of on my way to a meeting. My first business was a photography business and I used to do a lot of kind of university black tie yeah. balls and graduations and stuff. Yeah, and I, I realized that people always say that you kind of, you get good at something after 10,000 hours, which is give or take 10 years. Yeah. And actually I kind of realized that everything from a graphic design to photography to whatever, I realized I'd be good to, I'd be doing it for 12 years. And almost the reason why I think I was finally comfortable to make the jump on my own properly when I have responsibilities yeah. was almost because I started early and I probably made horrific mistakes, but the point is I didn't mind and I just kept going that actually yeah. now, you know, I'm still only 36. I've probably got 30 years left, but it was almost, I'm glad I started now as opposed to when I was 50, just because I can just keep getting better and better and better. So I think that's a yeah. superb one. And then just to kind of wrap up, what is the big dream for yourself? What's the kind of what's in the future? Um, for me, it's really diversifying, um, working on myself, um, like I say, property wise, diversifying into that aspect of it and other aspects. Uh, and then on a, on a career level, it's, it's moving into different areas. So all the stuff we've kind of touched upon working on, uh, at some point getting some publications, some articles out there to kind of get a bit of a, uh, a research basis from myself, which I'm put in the process of doing during the master side of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then working on that is working on my personal brand and, and doing some talks. I've been discussing with some friends who work in different aspects of, 
of healthcare. Yep. Uh, and we're going to do some talks to our patients and kind of merging that healthcare together. So again, kind of what we've been talking on throughout um, and just really push that avenue because there's a, you know, we've got a good platform to do stuff these days with, uh, with all these different social media aspects and stuff. And so it's just pushing that, that out there. And that's why I said about starting earlier, it's stuff I thought about yep. a couple of years ago, four years ago, and uh, I should have done it then, but yeah, can't live with regrets. So we're doing it now. Honestly, I think that's brilliant advice. The, I, yeah, I think it's spot on for anyone that wants to do anything, almost just start, even if you, you know, start part-time and you kind of build up to it. There's, there's so many good people out there that are all in the same boat. They're all at different, maybe ages in the kind of stages in their career, but actually everyone's going through the same uh, boat. And actually I think that's a, you know, great piece of advice. So I appreciate that. Um, I'm, I've been really impressed with everything you've been doing. I've really enjoyed this kind of chat on many levels and actually just being able to pick apart and explore how different business models work but actually what it does it does show that the, the core themes are the same in oil and gas and manufacturing and dentistry and property and healthcare that actually it's almost it's given me a little bit more confidence that you know when i'm looking to build my own brand and just trying to you know learn myself um just you're trying to identify the common threads so jake thank you for your time hopefully uh, we'll catch up at old boys next year um, but no, please kind of stay in touch. Uh, I'm sure we'll kind of touch, you know, uh, keep talking offline. Uh, thank you for your time today. I'm sure everyone kind of appreciates the thoughts and the things that you've kind of shared. And yeah, I'm sure I'll see you soon. Yeah, thanks very much, Steve. It's been appreciated. Yeah, no take care. Cheers, mate. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.